Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This is episode 96 of the Garden DC podcast. We talk with Heather Wheatley, Director of Education at Homestead Gardens, all about women in the horticultural industry. You'll definitely want to listen to her childhood memories of her grandmother, Hildreth Morton, the owner of Bittersweet Hill Nurseries. She was also a founding member of the International Water Garden Society. Also in this episode is a plant profile on witch hazels, and I share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events you might want to attend. This episode, we're joined by Heather Wheatley. She is the Director of Education at Homestead Gardens, based in Davidsonville, Maryland. Welcome, Heather. Thanks for having me. I'm such a huge fan. Thanks for joining us, Heather, and it's great to have a fan and a longtime friend to talk to. And our topic today is all about women in horticulture. This is Women's History Month, and so I thought that would be a great topic to delve into with you, especially because we're going to talk about your career arc and some of your family history. Great. Great. Well, but aren't we lucky to be able to talk about women in horticulture? I mean, much less, you know, our month, Women's Month, but to have mm-hmm. women in horticulture. I mean, it took so long for, you know, women to be recognized seriously in landscape architecture, in garden design, in general horticulture, where we contributed to plant breeding and things like that. I mean, for so long, it was thought that we couldn't even take a site survey on, on mm-hmm. a, you know, on lands on a landscape. So, so I'm grateful for today yes. and, and every day in my career, of course. Yeah. And it's great to be able to do something that we love. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just giving a garden club talk yesterday and a lady had come up to me and said, I bet you hate your job. And, you know, obviously sarcastically. Oh, yeah, <laughs> said, sure. And I said, yeah, it's tough to write about gardens and plants and flowers all day long. Right, right. Yeah, I go to the grocery store all the time and, you know, I barely have clean hands. You know, I keep wipes in the car because you're always, you know, hands in soil all day. And I, I never know if there's, you know, smudge on my face or whatever. And, and you know, the people at, at Safeway, they know me pretty well because it's my local grocery store. And then some of the customers there, some of the customers at my where I work now at Homestead Gardens in Davidsonville. And they're always like, oh, there's Homestead Heather. And I'm for sure <laughs> have like something on my face every time. It's so mm. good though. Yeah, I would say that my local post office and grocery store is also very familiar <laughs> with me um, coming in looking like head to toe mud caked, sure. um, like some crazy person sure. and, and hair stuffed into a baseball hat. And I'm like, well, it, this is how I am. It's just going to be like that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but, you know, it's more than just a, a career, you know, it's a, it's a lifestyle. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, you yeah. just, that's, that's how we, that's how we live. I can't tell you how many times I've run outside in my pajamas, just hoeing away, you know, pulling at weeks because the morning is cool and the neighbors go by and I'm like, oh my gosh, the neighborhood's awake. And I pull <laughs> back into the house, you know. <laughs> Yeah. So true. Yeah. I was being razzed by a neighbor just the other day for, he was like, you're out in your PJs. And I was like, oh yeah. 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 Well, sure. Why not? And I, mean, and I was like, oh, that's all of us these days though. Not just the gardeners were spending the day in the PJs a lot. Oh, that's so, true. but I was going to say that harkens back when you were saying about women in horticulture being recognized now is that it's always been the case that women have been in horticulture. It's just right. not been so recognized but one of the things in our history is the victorian era where it was frowned on for ladies as a as opposed to women who worked in the home who were the maids or cooks or that sort of thing Mm -hmm. Uh, but ladies of leisure were not to play with flowers uh, especially orchids because those are the sexual parts of the plants (laughs) that's right that it's so true you know it's funny i'm no less a lady than anyone in the 1800s 
Um, but I don't, you know, I don't trussle up the back of my dress, but still those women, you know, Gertrude Jekyll and Beatrice Ferrand, they, they, they had to be ladies and gardeners and, Mm -hmm. you know, they weren't sorry for it. (laughs) (laughs) They weren't sorry for it. Um, No, but you know, they did take the heat for us. They did bear the stigmatism. In fact, um, my grandmother, Hildreth Morton, had a little nursery in Davidsonville, Bittersweet Home Nurseries. And I remember when I was little, you know, she would do designs for horse races and things like that in the county. And when it was time to be paid, we would go to, you know, the owner of the track's house and um, they would meet us at the side door. For, for my grandmother to be paid. So, I mean, and that was just in the 70s. So all the way, you know, from from the mid 1800s till even the 70s, it just, it just wasn't. I mean, it wasn't a career for us that was recognized properly in a way. I was going to say, but the history of it and, you know, the history of witchcraft and Wiccan oh, sure, and, sure, sure. and healers, those yeah. were the herb growers, the right. ones who were familiar with plants and all the indigenous peoples where um, some of the females of the groups were healers as well. And right. you would go to the side door or the back door to be given some healing herb, but, you know, it wasn't the front door. No, so it was no. always like either something that they were doing on the side. Right. And that you just knew the person to talk to, right. or it was something that you had to actually hide right. um, and that you were doing that. Sure. And on top of that, never fairly compensated for the work that you were doing, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes it was, you know, because you were just the healer, you were looking out for the people right. and, or, you know, you wouldn't even think about taking something, uh, but, or it was maybe a barter. Right. So you exactly. would, you would help deliver somebody's baby and right. then they would give you a couple of chickens the next right. year or something. Right. Yeah. They saved, saved their lives, but you know, they mm-hmm. brought you a pie, which is great. <laughs> Everybody loves pie, but you know, in this day and age, I can tell you, we have made great strides in being you know, invited to the front of the house, of course, but also being well compensated for our contributions. So I'm grateful for that. And because these women met at the side door, because they had the, you know, the wherewithal to keep moving forward. Now I have a very successful career with Homestead Gardens. And that's a good point that we'll delve into maybe some of the salary and compensation issues that, Mm -hmm. um, kind of are dissuading some people from getting into horticulture these days. But before we jump into that, Heather, we're going to rewind to what you're talking about, where you were a small child with your grandmother's horticultural business. But let's rewind all the way to baby Heather and and ask (laughs) whether she was born with with chlorophyll in her veins and a green thumb. Definitely. I definitely had green blood and a green fist. But I did also, even though my grandmother was an agrarian, a horticulturist, um, I still had to fight to be in this industry. I started out in with the Department of Justice in the criminal division. And, you know, that was that was what my life was going to be, according to, you know, the one gardener that I admired the most in my life. Uh, she, you know, she basically wanted to scare me out of horticulture because, I mean, she quote unquote said, <laughs> no, you'll starve to death and die. (laughs) I said, I don't, you know, um, there's gonna, it's not always going to be like this grandma. It's not always going to be like this where I, you know, this field isn't going to take care of its own. So, um, I was with the department of justice for 11 years before she said, okay, I get it. This is what you're supposed to be doing. This is what you want to do. Because I would work all day in in the city and I would come home and I would count seeds with her. I would make tags. All of my Latin is learned at the end of a grease pencil making tags for plant material. You just can't, you cannot scare someone out of what their life path is going to be. This hmm. is, you just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it with me, which is what I'm supposed <laughs> to do. So... Yeah, I can't say I disagree with her and that she was trying to give you a steady career path and something fulfilling. And that, But when you were working with her in the evenings and mm-hmm. helping with the business, you were learning so much from her. So yeah. can you talk some about that pass along? Yeah, yeah. Well, she but she was a she was a consummate teacher. There was no I mean, you didn't spend any time with my grandmother without learning 
constantly. So, you know, when I was little, I think I was nine or 10, I guess uh, the first thing I, I was allowed to plant was uh, nasturtium seeds. And so, you know, she taught me about scarification and, and getting that seed, you know, nice and sanded off so that it would germinate and the whole time talking with me about it. And then it, she did actually let me pick the plant that I wanted to plant from her collection of seeds. She had some Johnny apple seeds and things like that. And so I picked the nasturtium. What I didn't realize was she was going to let me plant them, of course, but then I had to write tags for all of them in <laughs> Latin <laughs> and the common name. And I, I just, I rue the day that I didn't pick Cosmos or something like that, but that's how it started. So, so every moment with her was learning from, from the time I was little until I was just begging to work with her, you know, at the nursery. And so after the Department of Justice, yeah. did you join her business or did. did you strike out on your own? No, no, no. So um, at that point, I still had more to learn from her. And I learned from her every single day until she left. So um, she left, she died in 2009, 2008. And so I stayed with her the, you know, the whole time. I mean, there, there were bigger opportunities. This was a hometown nursery um, in the same town where Homestead Gardens was. And Homestead Gardens, um, as you know, um, is a Mecca. You know, it, it calls people from the tri-state area. And um, my grandmother's nursery, Bittersweet Hill Nursery, was very specialized. So she specialized in herbs, some rare conifers, and and aquatic plants. So she grew the Victoria from Longwood. Um, they brought seeds down to her and, and she would grow them in her big ponds and they would study them. And um, so it was really specialized. And there, yeah, there were greater opportunities to be had, but none to be side by side with, you know, Hildreth Morton of Bittersweet Hill Nurseries. So, mm -hmm. so you know, I did that. I'm, and I'm so pleased to say that I was able to meet her before yeah. her passing and, yeah. and to visit that nursery. Okay. And, and it's, I still see the sign on the way to Homestead Gardens. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, it's, it's still held very dear by the town. Um, and, and, you know, after my grandmother left, I, I, I reached out for the opportunities that were previously offered. And um, I'm, Worked with Kurt Blumel, um, the father of ornamental grasses in America, which was amazing to me. But I was, you know, an hour and a half, almost two hours away from Davidsonville. So I had to, at that point, I was either a horticulturist or I wasn't. Because before, I mean, of course, I, I studied horticulture and, and I, I worked in horticulture and I worked with my grandmother. But honestly, she was such an icon. I was always going to be. Hildreth Morton's granddaughter, right? So I wasn't sure on my own, did I have the chops? And so Kurt says, well, you're going to figure it out. And, <laughs> and, it, and it worked out great. I did. And I was with him for five years before, before he left, before he died. And then I went to North Creek Nurseries. So I've had a lot of amazing opportunities with a lot of visionaries and uh, starting, of course, with, with my grandmother. So and North Creek Nurseries is known in the Mid-Atlantic area for their native plants. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, and which is interesting that they're known for their native plants, because I'll tell you what, what, I mean, the mission of that nursery is beyond today. I mean, they're looking generations ahead when they pick plant material. So they're not, I mean, they do have other plants other than natives, and I'm glad that we were famous or are famous for natives, but I'll tell you what they do that I see very little of or not enough of in the industry is they're looking for meaningful, resilient plant material that does a job. They, they want to solve ecologically, they want to solve environmental issues, and they're doing it brilliantly. And I, and almost, almost not without people knowing, but you know, that they're famous for native plant material is great, but, mm -hmm. but they're, they're putting together plant communities with customers on the phone, or they're giving advice in, in, to a lot of the landscape architects and, and they're putting these plant communities together that solve either current, like stormwater management and things like that, um, drought tolerant plant material or future 
um, environmental issues that they're they're forecasting that these things are coming. You know, certain areas are flooding, so we need to get more you know uh, monarda in that area or pycnanthemum in that area to bring the pollinators up. I mean, they really are connecting people to plants in such an amazing, meaningful way. And that visionary um, Steve Castorani, that he knew way, I mean, years, years, years before these words became even common speak, you know, resilience and, and, you know, plant communities and meaningful and ecological solutions and things like this is just part of his vocabulary. And he just knew he was going to get this plant material out into the, to the community, definitely the mid-Atlantic, but you can see other, other nurseries emulating his effort. Yeah, such a visionary and, and mm -hmm. such a great education on the website, too. Okay. I think the strong correlation between North Creek nurseries and native plants comes from the great marketing of the American Beauties yeah, program. Yeah. Yes. And that's probably why. So if you've ever been to a local nursery and purchased uh, something that has a tag that says American Beauties Native Plants collection that's probably come from North Creek Nurseries yep. if you're in the Mid-Atlantic area, but there is a grower also up in Lebanon, Connecticut, Pride's Corner Farms that yep. is producing them as well. Yeah. And at Homestead, we have both. We have AB Natives as well. And um, we are also working with Cavanaugh's uh, and of course, North Creek Nursery on the Mount Cuba collection that they're going to introduce soon. And we will be one of the first nurseries to offer that plant material. So if you're, I know you're familiar with Mount Cuba um, mm -hmm. and their trials are magnificent and so much re research is done to um, select plant material, but now they're, you know, they're putting their money where their mouth is and they're making those collections available. That's exciting. I know, I can't wait. I think because everybody who goes to Mount Cuba leaves asking, where's the plant shop? Where's the, where can I buy these plants that I just saw the trial gardens for, that I just saw these wonderful things in the display gardens. And then you're like, now I need to buy it. Yeah. So that's going to be a great uh, connector to have that and to be able to say, well, here's the nursery that's, that's stocking that. So that's great. Yeah. We're so proud to have that collection. And we opened a nursery in, um, Smyrna, Delaware, which is mm -hmm. maybe an hour and a half outside of where Mount Cuba is. So, you know, if you're in the Hokessin area and you go to Mount Cuba and then you stop by and get Letty's chicken because that is the best chicken on the planet, um, you can, you can, you know, bring a picture of something that you saw there. And if it's part of our collection, I mean, you can take it home. Okay. So it's not Hokessin, it's Hokessin? Hokessin. 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 And then mm -hmm. say the name of the chicken place again. Oh, I got to jot that down. Letty's Chicken. Uh, L-E-T-T-I-E-S? Uh, L-E-T-T. -T -T yes. Okay. I -E -S. Great. Yes. Yeah. I, so I, that's just down from um, uh, Stephen Peg Castorani's um, home in, in mm -hmm. Hokessin. So they're like, you, you have to go get this chicken. So anytime we go to Gateway Garden <laughs> Center, which I love, huge mm -hmm. that garden center, I always stop at Letty's, get the chicken, bring it over to their um, their garden center, and then they eat chicken and I shop the, the plants. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's uh, people who are listening from outside the Mid-Atlantic area, maybe oh. internationally, mm -hmm. might not be familiar with the fact that the eastern shore of Maryland and Delaware are a huge uh, chicken producing area. Okay. Um, so you'll see these like rows and rows and rows of I guess it's chicken barns or sheds, they yeah. usually call them. They wouldn't use the word barn. Yeah. Um, chicken sheds that you'll see and you'll be like, you'll think those are plants, but no, those are chickens in those sheds. That's right. Right. Mm. And there there are so many chickens that um, we, a, a lot of us um, who garden use chicken compost. So we, we definitely, it's a full circle of life there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So we're, we're eating the chickens, but then the chickens are feeding us and that's, that's the way it should be. Right. Um, right. So, and then we're growing what they eat. So that's okay. always good too. Yeah. So yeah, it's a small world in the little mid Atlantic Delmarva uh, peninsula of overlapping with agriculture and horticulture. Yeah. And that does bring us back to women in horticulture. And I was just reading um, some USDA statistics about women farmers and the agriculture side of things and how the census every 10 years of farmers or so mm -hmm. um, had not asked 
about secondary farmers working on the farm. So it was just the one farmer. And when you filled out the for form, it was probably the male or the owner who filled it out. Right. So it never said, and my wife also works on the farm or, and my sister also co-owns it. So it was always just one person represented on the form. So now they've expanded it. And the number of women farmers has expanded greatly. And they're like, they were always there. That's right. They were always they just there. Were, they just weren't counted because oh, yeah. from my uh background it, from my dad's side of the family of Indiana farmers, I could tell you their women were working right alongside all the time. Again, they just weren't counted. Sure. I was, I was talking to one of my grandchildren. I have four granddaughters and a grandson. And I was talking to uh, my one granddaughter, um, Hannah. And I said, Hey, Hannah, do you know what they call a farmer's wife? And she's like, she says, I know grandma, they call her a farmer. Like <laughs> that you're darn right they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm like, when that corn needs to come in or whatever that harvest or that seed needs to go on the ground, it's oh, all hands, all on, hands deck. on deck. For sure. Nobody is like sure. sitting, you know, knitting in front of the fireplace. It's it, it's very <laughs> right. intensive and you know, because it's weather dependent and there's narrow time windows to do things. Mm. It, it all has to get done at once. And right. so, you know, long days days, long nights, and then um, all at once type of schedules. And I was going to say, besides those grandchildren, I hear an animal in the background. So talk, talk about them. Oh, I have these corgis. They're so crazy. I'm telling you, um, for any of your listeners, if you were a gardener, the English bulldog is the way to go because I have these English <laughs> corgis and they're insane. They bring in bulbs in the house they they oh I had two English bulldogs a friend of mine David Culp um fantastic um hellebore breeder amazing writer he gave me one of his dogs uh actually the his name was Winston and his sister's name one of my favorite um women in our industry um Vita Sackville West <laughs> was his sister's name so here's this little you know great garden dog Winston and Vita and they were they were just so great but now I have these corgis and I'll tell you go with the English bulldog note note to friends <laughs> well it's always nice to have animal companions in the garden too and oh, yeah, my, yeah my brother has a corgi it's kind of it's kind of its name is Pippin it's mm -hmm. a little bit of a large side size in the corgi spectrum oh yeah but He's not, I don't think he's too much out in the garden, but, you know, aside from liking to chase squirrels and that sort of thing and to corral people because they're, you know, they're, they're herding dogs. Yes, they are definitely herding dogs. Nine, Nigel does it at, at 9.15. Alexa, Alexa tells you, you know, it's time for bed. And Nigel's like, oh, now see, Alexa told you, let's go. So everybody gets rounded up. <laughs> so, yeah, it's great. So for um, advice to somebody wanting to get into horticulture, be they a female, male, or anywhere on the spectrum, um, what would be your advice for either going to college, getting a job or an internship? What avenue would you think would be the best way to get into it? Oh, such a great question. I mean, I, I've done it all. So I, I went to Hildreth Morton University, um, but then I also attended the University of Maryland. Um, they have a great program in their plant sciences. They have the um, applied science program that you can do in two years, which is great. I've gone to school in Europe. I went to school in, in France to learn sustainable horticulture. I took a program in Sheffield in England. I've done all of it. And I'm telling you, the thing is, you can you can crack a book and you can learn everything that you want to learn. And, and I'm not poo-pooing that. It's great. But I had 20 years of experience prior to even setting foot in a classroom. And I only went because I wanted to know current best horticultural practices. Sustainability became really important to me in my, in my thinking, in, in what I wanted to contribute to the industry. So, so I did that, but I was fine without it. I, I can tell you gardeners, um, green people, uh, horticulturists, agriculturists, my grandmother, great example. We will teach you everything that you want to know. What else did we do it for? You know, if not mm -hmm. to share it with each other. So I can tell you if you, if, if, you know, you can have a career either way. So 
And it depends on really specifically what part of the industry you want to make your contribution. So you can't necessarily show up on a, on a civil engineering job and give your opinion, however accurate it might be, without credentials or experience. So, you know, some of those things are going to be necessary. But so far as garden design, I mean, if you have passion and aptitude, a lot of times that's enough. I mean, it really is. Yeah, there's so many, I would say, self-taught and and like you, they were brought up with it, you know, culturally in their family and their background. It's just that's who they are and that's what they do. Right. And then there's the other side who went into something else for 30 or 40 years. Maybe they were a teacher or lawyer or something like that. And then their calling was plants. So they either went into a couple year degree program Mm -hmm. or they took a job at a local garden center and then transitioned for the second half of their life, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So we, and, and Homestead uh, facilitates the success of those people really beautifully. So we have people who, um, you know, this is their second career. They, the, they stayed home with the kids. They were an attorney and, and then they decided to have children. They stayed home with the children and they're like, you know what? It's my time now. What do I want to do? And they, you know, know in their heart of hearts that they want to work with plants and, and flowers and, and grow things and, and collaborate with customers about their gardens. And, and Homestead offers that at any level, you can come to Homestead and, and, we can build a career for you, um, or you can just enjoy a job after work. So, but yes, you're right. The second career people are amazing. They come at the industry with such passion and such commitment. And it's an, it's admirable. I love working with them. Yeah. And I would say that's true of a lot of lo- your local garden centers is just mm-hmm. to go in and ask, yeah. um, because there's obviously seasonal work, but then there are more that will take you under their wing and teach you right. as you go. Right. Well, so so Homestead Gardens um, is really, really committed to education. So Brian Riddle, the, um, the owner of our company, another visionary, I, I can't believe the luck of my career. I just, if I sat back and thought about it, I would probably just die. But I, I work with Brian riddle and he it's so key to him that however long we have you at homestead even if it's your first job or it's your after work job or he is committed to making sure that you get educated about plant material the impact that it can have on your family by putting in vegetables and the economic benefit to to your household of, of putting in vegetables so he's committed um an entire entire office, my office, the office of education to connecting people to plants in a really meaningful way. So when, when the customer comes in, they're talking to a staff member who has a huge background of information about plant material. You cannot work at Homestead if you don't know at least 30 plants within Mm -hmm. your first 30 days. So, I mean, sure. So the after school kids, I say, you know, okay, does everybody eat a salad? So when you get asked, you know, do you know 30 plants? You, everything in that bowl, except the chicken and the bacon is a, is a plant, you know, so, so they learn plants that way, you know, how it works in their life every day. And then, you know, we have other people who are like, well, so what's the botanical name of, of the tomato or what's the botanical name of a cucumber? And, you know, they're all in, in a different level, but Brian has committed hours on the clock, um, including my whole career to educating um, our team on, on, um, in horticulture. So it's really great. That is so great. And that's a great point that your title director of education is inward facing Mm -hmm. towards staff almost more than it is as far as educating your customers. So you have separate classes and, and I have to say here that I, uh, do work for Homestead Gardens, giving some talks and Zoom talks. And yeah, brilliant, and, by the way. Thank you so much thanks. for all that you do for us. And I totally enjoy that. But that's towards the customers, which right. of course any of your employees could sit in on and learn from as well. Sure, sure. But most of your training is focused in your job to training the staff. And that what's, that's what differentiates, I think, in my opinion, a great garden center from, you know, your local 
um, big box stores, of course, oh, where sure. they're just doing minimal training or right. just like a stand on the corner where they just throw out some annuals, right. sell them, and then they close up for the season. Right, right. So, and, and Brian recognized that right away. So when I first started um, with Homestead, I did do a lot of workshops and lectures and things like that with customers. And Brian saw the potential that, you know, he could build an army of horticulturists so that every customer had a chance to talk with someone that was educated and understood, you know, um, the foundation of soil or the direction of light or plant communities that were resilient that I learned at, at North Creek. And, um, if, if I moved, uh, you know, into, internal education well there's more there's more staff than there is just me so if each one of them has the information that I have or at least knows where to find the information you know in a scholarly way not you know not Google I mean Mm -hmm. but Google has a great bit of information but um, I could share that with them and they could share that with the customer and then our mission gets farther and it becomes bigger and we call in more people with a greater understanding of, Mm -hmm. you know, the benefits of horticulture. So, yeah. So, I mean, well done. I mean, I love my job. So well done, Brian, but generally (laughs) well done for the community of gardeners. I mean, on, on Brian Riddle's behalf, because he saw it, he saw it quickly. He's like, Heather, here's what we're going to do. And I'm like, well, yes, we are. That's exciting. (laughs) Yes, let's do that. So now I have a whole bunch of people in each store, the Smyrna store um, in Delaware, the Severna Park store um, in Maryland also, and in the Davidsonville store where any member of our team, especially our full-time green goods team, can give a lecture on almost any subject. So now I have lots and lots of garden educators in the stores. Yeah, it's such a pleasure to be able to talk to a staff person. And and, while there is that aspect of gardening where you ask two gardeners, get three answers. Um, So it's great to always get a number of opinions because someone will say, well, there's this and my experience is that. So, and that's nothing that you're going to learn on Google or YouTube University. It's all about talking to other gardeners and their experiences. Yeah, that's right. So, Moving on to in the women and hort topic, uh, to pay. So let's talk about that sticky issue of money. Yeah. And so there's been a drop off in the number of people pursuing horticultural degrees um, and entering the profession. So that's been a, a huge thing of concern across the board, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, and one of those issues is because a degree is so expensive that it's just not worth it, right, to to pursue a horticulture degree if you look at the numbers. So it really has right. to be a passion. Right. But um, so how can we address that? So that's, that's such a great question because I do love the University of Maryland and I do want to pack every seat in the house there, especially in their plant sciences, um, especially in the Institute of Applied Agriculture there. And I think it comes down to specializing. So uh, anyone can learn horticulture, obviously. Anyone can learn gardening, obviously. But what we need now are less of the fine horticulture degrees and more of the degrees that address ecology in a bigger way. Plants are always going to be a part of that. And you do need to know horticulture on your own, you know, study it and, and, and love it. And most of us who do love it, always study it. I mean, it's always changing. But I think that it is important that we do go to school, that we do get a background in the ecological needs of this planet. I mean, part of our work is stewardship. As as horticulturists, is stewardship. And so if you don't know, you know, how things work, and that that is definitely taught beautifully in a classroom how things work, then when you, when you go out to make your contribution, you're making one, but it could be fuller. It, it could be more science-based. It could be more, more of what we project the world is going to be. And, and all of that research is given to the universities and shared by the universities with the students. So it does put us a little bit ahead, those of us who have um, sought education, formal education, 
Um, I know when I first started at the University of Maryland and I was talking about sustainable agriculture and they were like, yeah, oh yeah, you know, that's a, that's definitely a subject, not a degree here, but certainly a subject. Um, let's get you, you know, somewhere where you can learn that. And it was very expensive to go to Europe to, to go to school, but that's where the education was. And I think now as those, these subjects are coming to the forefront and, and, the, the industry is evolving. Those degrees are now available at the University of Maryland. And if you specialize in some part or some facet of horticulture, agriculture, then, then you are going to probably need the university's help with that. If it is expensive, I, I mm-hmm. have to say it is expensive, but we also foster, we, as in the people of horticulture, foster your, um, you know, your studies through hort- through um, scholarships. So American Hort offers scholarships. Um, the American, the AHS, American Horticulture Society offers scholarships. The Perennial Plant Association, they, they have scholarships hand over fist. They will do whatever they can do to help you pursue your passion um, for horticulture in the universities. Yeah, that's so true about the scholarship offerings I see mm-hmm. from from GardenCom, the Garden Communicators right. Association that's I'm right. in has a as a scholarship, and sometimes there are not that many applicants, so definitely start to look out for those. And they're not merit based. A lot of the scholarships are just like, do you want to pursue <laughs> a plant career? That's right. We want we want to give you money, so right. definitely right. be it. So those are great programs to look into. And that does bring us to some of the groups and networking that women in horticulture can do. So one that I'm in locally is called Ladies in the Landscape, and that's a fairly new organization. Mm. It's just incorporated as a 501c3, so it's just a year or so old, and that's for anybody in horticulture at all. Um, and that's basically a networking group for on the business side of things. I'm going to check that and, out. Ladies in the Landscape, huh? Yep. I'll, I'll put the link up in the show notes. And then that's there's super. Women in Horticulture mm-hmm. um, that's based in, I think, the Philadelphia area of Pennsylvania, and they're kind of starting up an organization. And as far as I know, they've done some in-person meetings like uh, the Barnes uh, up in Philadelphia, mm-hmm. but that they're a Facebook group mostly and a networking group that way. Yeah. And then another networking group on Facebook that I was going to call people's attention to who are interested in horticultural careers is the Emergent. Oh, so yes. just like that, a series of books, Divergent, okay. blah, blah, blah. So Emergent. And uh, that's for, it was, I think, created by Brie Arthur. I believe that she created that page and Mm -hmm. that's a group looking for, if you're looking for a job, there's job postings that people share. If you're trying to pursue the career or you're switching career and that I've seen so many great discussion threads, Heather, of, you know, what it's like to be a woman in the industry or what it's like to work for minimum wage when you have a college degree. um, But that's your passion. So there's been lots of discussions about the pay levels and who pays what and maybe some areas of the country pay better than others so if you're looking to make it a career maybe you need to move uh, has been one of the discussions i've seen mm-hmm. recently so very yeah. interesting yeah you know that that is interesting so so i can say the other thing that um education will do for you is um entry level jobs in our industry are are minimum wage they are um but once you develop a skill set um, you can move up pretty quickly. If you come in with a degree in that field, then you would start, you know, we would build build you up as a leader um, and start you at a, you know, a, a very livable wage. I'm very capable of feeding my two corgis on, <laughs> on my, um, on my salary at Homestead. And you can, you can bring more diverse degrees in. So if you have a degree in sociology or things, something like that, um, we can teach you horticulture and, and you can use your sociology, you know, your your commitment to education in the first place at, in a leadership role. So, um, yeah, I mean, yes, the, the starting pay for, you know, garden centers is, is a minimum wage. The starting pay for a grower or um, someone, who, a field hand or a, an apprentice propagator, those, those are, they are all minimum wage jobs. But passion and aptitude will move you quickly through the ranks. We have no problem in our industry recognizing, you know, greatness. 
yeah, I would say nurturing talent mm -hmm. and then also voicing it and letting people know that you are interested in moving up, you know, you know, I, I want to learn the business, you know, if you say that, and there's so many people willing to be mentors out there um, oh, yeah. and take you under their wing. So joining some of those networking groups that I mentioned, uh, um, and we talked a little bit about Perennial Plant Association, that's a great one to be yeah. part of. And some of them actually have separate mentoring tracks to pair you up with somebody in the industry. Right. That's um, right. So that's another way to get your, your um, self you know, seen as more on the leader track than right. as I'm just going to be, you know, plugging in trays for the next, you know, 80 years. Right. Which is not a bad life. <laughs> it's nope. not a bad yeah. life. And if, if that's what you want to do and you want to sit right. and listen to this podcast while you're doing it, we that's love right. you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And it's very zen and satisfying work to, yeah. you know, move yeah. those seedlings up from one tray to the next. But then there's others who are like, one day I want to own my own garden center. One day I want to be owning a firm and design or that sort yeah, of thing. So sure. just depends on your ambition. Yeah. So I was going to ask you for some of your sheroes. So women in horticulture who went before us and maybe even some contemporaries that you admire. Right. Right. Well, I think, um, I, I did mention, um, Vita Sackville West, obviously I loved her work. She's an English gardener and I just, I have always, admired her work but uh because we still use garden rooms so she was the you know the purveyor of the garden room instead of those big long you know walks and you can see the entire garden from the from the front mm -hmm. of the garden to the back she put in those garden rooms and so I love that about her and that design concept has lasted forever you know we still do it but you know more contemporary I love the work of Beth Chatto. I mean, she was amazing. <laughs> it's terrible. These are all English gardeners that I'm listing, but I can tell you, I think I mentioned early um, or when we were talking that I have been very fortunate in my career. Mm -hmm. And so one of the women that I admire the most modern times takes an entirely different look at horticulture other than, you know, Beth Chatto who solved gardening problems. You know, she had great plant list of things that would work, um, you know, if your area was damp or if it was dry or if it was, you know, that was innovative for her time. And then the garden rooms was innovative for, innovative for Vita's times. But I, at North Creek, worked with Claudia West um, for a few mm -hmm. years. And I can tell you, she's, she's making strides to get us awake about these issues in ecology that we can solve by gardening, by putting in garden, by selecting meaningful plant material, by knowing the difference between a garden worthy plant or a meadow worthy plant. Does the, you know, when you're making plant selections and, and you're putting in gardens, even in a public space, is it teaching someone something? Are they seeing what we should define as new, as the new beauty? I can tell you, she, I've never seen a single design that she's done that has a lawn in it. <laughs> so, um, yep. She's making gardens work for us. And I mm -hmm. think she's just wildly, wildly courageous in the work that she does in her firm at Fido. Um, you were saying earlier, you know, you can start by putting in plugs and then, you know, and while away the hours dreaming about your own garden center, she ha must have always had a firm in mind where she could do exactly what she wanted and show things exactly the way that she saw them and, and make a difference. I mean, her contribution, uh, her stewardship is mm -hmm. infectious. Yep. So I, I have been very lucky to, um, to see Claudia get her message across. I mean, across the country at a minimum, I've seen her new, her book, um, planting in a post wild world with um, Thomas Rainier translated in I, I guarantee I've seen it in six different languages already yeah she is in, incredible and if you ever get the chance to see her talk you know grab that chance to oh, see yeah. her her right presentations are are yeah just wonderful yep. and so yep. I was going to say that that kind of brings us to the future of women in horticulture and maybe horticulture in general mm -hmm. so we have 
millennials coming into their own and buying their own homes and starting families and then Gen Z right behind them and then the next generation. So what are you seeing in your granddaughters, your grandchildren, and the next generation who are working at Homestead and the future of horticulture? Well, a lot. I mean, I I do see a lot of change. So I'm Generation X. So, and my daughter is a millennial, although if she listens to your podcast, and I know she does, she's going to take my face off for that. But (laughs) she she believes her generation is, um, you know, more of the Generation C, right? Generation C is care, connect, commit, contribute. Um, Hmm. And I see a lot of those women now, um, you know, moving into the industry. There's, um, there's a gal, she, I think she was at Cornell. I think she graduated from Cornell. Her name's Blythe Yost. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's developed this thing called Tilly. Have you heard of that? No, tell Um, me about that. It's fantastic. So it's called TillyDesign.com. And you go on there and you, as the homeowner, can can put in what it is that you want in a garden or in your landscape or how you're going to use it. And this website, no matter where you are in the country, will connect you to someone in the industry that can help you. At the garden center, we connect people to plants. This gal in her new way of thinking is connecting us to the consumer through this website. It's almost like match.com for gardening. That sounds fascinating. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's just such an interesting thing. And it's called TillyDesign.com. And her name is Blythe. I think she just graduated from Cornell or not Mm. long ago. So these people that are coming out, uh, you know, they're using technology in our industry. And speaking of technology and what we're hearing in the news lately about the metaverse and living in a um, virtual world, and it's such the antithesis of real world horticulture. (laughs) It's like, you know, of course you can grow a farm or a garden (laughs) virtually, um, and you'll hear people talk about their farms, Farmville and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. as a game. Um, But you still need to spend some time in the real world. So you still need to get those actual hands in the dirt, in the soil, yes. um, at your sun on your face yes. and, you know, the nose in, in, into a flower. So I think that will never go away no yeah. matter how and much we immerse ourselves. Right. Even if my monitor becomes scratch and sniff, if I don't spend 20 minutes trying to get the soil out from underneath my nails before I make dinner, I'm not going to be happy. Yeah. And there's something chemical that right. goes on that, you know, they, there's been studies, of course, that show that there's uh, the smell in the air after a rain and those sorts of chemicals that are released in the soil when you work it um, that connect with cells in our brain that give you endorphins. So there's, I, I'm like, maybe one day there'll be that type of uh, technical thing in the metaverse <laughs> that releases those endorphins and chemicals. But until then, it's just not going to be the same. No, I cannot live without Petrichor. It's raining today. Mm-hmm. And yes, it's just, it's everything. I don't know what happens. There's just some kind of seed inside that just swells when, when I'm connected to nature in any, any way even through petrichor for sure Mm -hmm. so for the budding women in horticulture no Mm -hmm. pun intended uh, that (laughs) are starting their careers or starting a second career um what advice would you give them um as far as so they've gotten their degree or they've gotten their you know, they've learned from their experiences and they want to take it to the next level. So is there a glass ceiling in the industry um, that they need to break through or, or what do you think it takes to get to that next level? No, you just lean in, you Mm -hmm. get a job, you make a difference, your contribution matters, you're counted and you keep going forward. There's no, there's no glass ceiling if you don't accept that there's one. So don't just keep making the contribution. You've committed, you know, um, to the education. You've committed, you know, to the hard work that it is, to the, you know, the dirty hands, dirty knees, ugly shoes, whatever it takes, your floppy hat. Just lean in. Own own your career. Define what that that what success looks like to you and take it. 
Wonderful advice, Heather. So how can our listeners get in contact with you or learn more about Homestead Gardens? Oh, so um, we're an independent garden center in um, in Davidsonville, Maryland, Severna Park, Maryland, and Smyrna, Delaware. And you can reach us at homesteadgardens.com. I'm always happy to talk with anyone. Um, we have a, sometimes we do a live podcast once a month on, or not a podcast, a uh, a live show on Facebook Mm -hmm. first Monday of the month. So they can come there and say, hi, they can ask gardening questions. They can ask me for a job. I would be delighted to find homes for every aspiring um, horticulturist Um, or they can reach me. They can send me an email at heather.wheatley at homesteadgardens.com. Yeah. My time is yours. So if you need advice on the program at the university of Maryland, I can connect you to the director, Glory Himes, Hyman, sorry. And she, she would love to talk with you about how to make that program affordable, to customize it so it meets your needs. Um, the University of Maryland is, is the place to be if you're on the East Coast. Good to know. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Oh, it was great to have you on the podcast. It, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Witch Hazel Plant Profile The Witch Hazel, Hamamila species, is a small tree with an open, vase-like structure that is treasured for its colorful foliage in fall and its beautiful flowers in late winter and early spring. To me, the blossoms resemble a bunch of tiny ballerinas or fairies dancing along the bare branches. Others liken them to spiders or ribbon fringe. Many of them are quite fragrant. The scent is often spicy with a touch of citrus. If you are a witch hazel aficionado, a visit to Green Springs Gardens in Alexandria, Virginia in late winter should be on your bucket list, as the extensive Hamamalus plantings have more than 250 witch hazels and 110 different types or unique taxa. Virginia's special connection to the species began with the British botanist, the Reverend John Bannister, He discovered the common witch hazel, Hemimelis virginiana, in 1678. This native witch hazel blooms in fall and is not as showy as its Asian relatives. It does have medicinal properties and is a good food source for pollinators. Witch hazels like well-drained but evenly moist soil. They are a forest understory plant that requires some shade from the full summer sun. They are not usually troubled by pests or diseases. Witch hazels are deciduous. In the fall, the leaves turn a golden bronze, then drop off. Well, most drop off, but some can hang on for months. Many gardeners strip them off as they are impatient and want to see the flowers unobscured by the now tattered and brown foliage. If you are looking at adding a witch hazel to your garden, I recommend Diane, Pallida, and Jelena. All are proven performers in the mid-Atlantic U.S. and are worth a showcase spot in your garden. This week in the garden, spring has sprung. Most notably, my forsythia, are blooming like crazy, as well as my thundercloud plum tree. Over at the community garden plot, we had a bit of a freeze last weekend with snow and ice, but the seeds that the interns and I planted the week before are starting to sprout and are looking healthy and fine. That includes the radish and a salad mix that we put in. I also added some peas this week. And in local gardening news, there's a couple events that you might want to attend. One is the Native Garden for Your Woodland Neighbors. That's taking place Tuesday, April 12th at 7 p.m. And it's virtual, so anybody anywhere can sign up for it. You would go to sustainabilitymatters.earth and then click on the events panel. This is all about learning to manage your woods or how to create a micro woodland if you don't already have one 
for the benefit of native wildlife and yourself. Another upcoming event that you might want to attend in the Washington DC area is the annual Glen Carlin Library Garden Spring Celebration and Plant Sale. And it's in commemoration of the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day. It takes place Saturday, April 23rd from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. There'll be an educational tree walk that's at 1 p.m. and it features beautiful native trees in and around the garden. There'll also be a small trees make big canopies program by the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. Happy gardening! Celebrate spring with four exciting gardening books and their authors. This free online party takes place on Thursday, March 24th at 7 p.m. Eastern. It is sponsored by National Garden Bureau and Garden Communicators. During this live webinar, you'll get to virtually meet the four authors and learn some of their best gardening tips. Those authors are Sean and Allison McManus, Christy Wilhelmy, Raphael Delalo, and Tony Gatoni. Attendees will also have a chance to win one of three gardening giveaways. Register for this free webinar at ngb.org, select the Education tab, and scroll down to Webinars. See you there. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jentz and Terry Spite, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space, while also making Making a lush outdoor living area you'll crave spending time in. The Urban Garden 101 Ways to Grow Food and Beauty in the City comes out this spring. You can pre order it now at Amazon.com and Bookshop.org. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to WashingtonGardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.